are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Well, we've been doing a series uh, that has been titled "Vertical Steward," or has been titled "God's Money," and it's all about vertical stewardship. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, we're going to continue that after two weeks um, of uh, having some guest speakers. By the way, did, uh, were, were you blessed by the guest speakers while, while I, we, I was away? Yeah, they did a fantastic job, right? And uh, so we, we're grateful for men who can teach God's Word and, uh, and, and uh, excited for what they were able to do with you. They did a great job. Um, but we get back into our series today called God's Money. It's a study of vertical stewardship. We're looking for what the Bible says uh, about our finances, and I'm going to uh, continue in that here this morning. Now, uh, in that, I recognize that we have a, a key uh, truth that we have been basing this whole series around. Anybody remember that truth? God owns it all. Very good, right? The title of, of this series is God's Money, and the idea that God owns it all is the basic foundational truth that is modifying every aspect of this, and we didn't just make that up. That comes straight from the Word of God. And, uh, and we see that God owns everything. I, I came across a great quote that helps reinforce that uh, by a, name, by a man, named, man named Dr. David Jones. He says, stewardship is the faithful management of God's resources in God's world to achieve God's objectives. I thought that was really good. That's what stewardship is. It's the management of God's resources in God's world to achieve God's purposes, God's objectives. And that's what we're trying to understand here. And to do that, we recognize that we can know that truth, but there's a key attitude we have to have. And that attitude is contentment. Really, that's the key to stewardship. Like if you're going to be a steward, you have to understand the attitude of contentment and be able to live within it. We, we then moved on to an understanding that if we're, uh, if we're going to have a relationship with God, the, part of what builds that relationship with Him is our giving and, uh, and, and how important it is that we would have a relationship with God. And, and He's given us different amounts to steward and, and to do things His way. And when we give, we build that relationship solidly with Him. And then next, we looked at a, what it means to have a generous heart and the idea that giving is worship. And when we are motivated by grace as we should, should be, uh, our, our hearts become generous hearts, not getting hearts. And that's the thing God's after. He wants our hearts. He wants our hearts, and that's what he's seeking for in this. And so throughout this series, I've done something. I've made you repeat back to me uh, really what I want you to hear from me in this process. Uh, a little bit of a warning, but also something that I think is helpful for all of us when it comes to learning from God's word about uh, his about God's money, and uh, that's the idea of this. Uh, your pastor doesn't want your money. Remember we said that before? Pastor doesn't want my money. Can, can you say that again? Go ahead, say it again. Pastor, you're right, I don't want your money. I, I used to say, pastor doesn't want your money, he wants your heart, but I realized that was a little assumptive and maybe some arrogance in it. I didn't mean to do that. I'm not looking for your heart. I don't, I, I'm not the one who is the master of your heart in any way. So I've changed it to say, I want to show you that God wants your heart. That's why we're doing this series. It's not because I need your money. It's not because I even want your money. But it's because I want to show you that God wants your heart and that what we do with our money is a significant marker as to where our heart really is. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at God's giving promises what are the promises that God gives to us when we actually become generous and we actually start giving the way that God has, ha, wants us to? And by the way, what is God's way of, of giving? And so we're going to end the message with God's giving plan. And so this morning, we're going to start with his promises. And then what is his plan? That's where we're going here this morning. And I need to start with a verse from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And this is really the whole message summed up in the like, can God say it in like a phrase if he wanted to? And it's going to take me the next 40 minutes to say what this phrase says right here, but that's okay. We're going to expound upon that a little bit. Here, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says that God rewards those who earnestly seek Him. God rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So what does God do? He he rewards. Say it out loud. What does God do? He rewards. God is a rewarding God. And we need to understand what that is and we need to look at what that means and that's really what the rest is what we're going to do. But in this, what would happen if we started to give the way that God 
teaches us to in his word. What, what would happen to us? What would happen to our money? What would happen to our possessions? What would happen to our family? And what would happen to our jobs and our relationships? And ultimately, what would happen to our hearts? That's what we're going for here this morning. In this, I want you to see that God is a rewarder. And by saying that, I'm not saying in any way that there's some sort of deal that you can make with God. There's not any sort of, if I do this and then God's going to do that type of thing in God's reward. We're going to see that very clearly here. Really what we see is that if we have gratitudes in our hearts for what He's done, for the indescribable indescribable gift that He's given to us, giving is something that is just flows right out, of, right out of our hearts. The reality is, as we talk about giving, and this is like my one message on giving of the eight-week series that we're doing, and a lot of times we start talking about giving in church and everybody shrivels up and it starts to get really tense there for a second, and, and there's been a lot of reasons for that in churches. There's been churches who've done some things that are very poor and very bad, but I want you to hear this. When you get to heaven, when you get to heaven you're not going to be able to say that you gave more than God gave to you. And and when you get to heaven, you're not going to think, oh man, I wish I would have given less. Because God is a rewarder. And and I want to show you that here this morning as we look at God's giving promises. We're going to look at those promises and then his plan for that. And so here's kind of the thing that's going to drive our whole thing this morning. Um, Write this down if you want to in your little notes. You have a spot up in the introduction. Uh, you could write this phrase down. God is a rewarding God who wants to free me financially to be the steward that gives. He, he, he's a rewarding God, and in that, He wants you to see the rewards of that, and, and He wants to unshackle you, and He wants to unchain you from, from the greediness that oftentimes creeps into our heart, and, and He wants to show you that, that as you give, that He rewards immensely and better can, than, you, than you could ever imagine. And, and you can actually come to a spot where giving is done cheerfully and willingly and excitedly, and it's the best thing you look forward to spending what you steward your money for the Lord. That only comes when we understand God's promises. And so I want to show you here this morning from four different passages the superiority of God's way of managing finances through giving. I'm going to use four passages because I want you to be really convinced. And a lot of times when we preach, we're, we're always preaching to, to change the heart and to let the Spirit of God kind of open that and do that in you. And there's different ways that we do that. Sometimes we teach and it's motivational and persuasive and Today is teaching, okay? Can we handle that? Can we do some teaching this morning? You can put your thinking caps on. Okay, everybody? Thinking caps, right? Okay? And some teaching. We're going to go through some things this morning. Not just one passage, but a couple of things to help us understand God's promises for givers. Write that down. He has some promises for you if you'll give the way that He intends for you to give. He has some things that you can put the, the, the bedrock of your life, you can stand upon and you can, you can believe the promises that He's given if you'll, by faith, understand these things. And so first, some examples from the Old Testament here this morning. Some examples, um, two actually examples from the Old Testament. And if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Kings, the book of 2 Kings chapter, eight here, or chapter 4 here this morning. And we're going to start with the story uh, of a woman, the Shunammite woman, Um, here this morning, and um, it starts with this. Here's a little bit about giving here this morning. Here's here's something about giving from the story of the Shunammite woman. It says in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, one day Elisha went down to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn there and he would eat food. What we find here is a woman who is wealthy, it says, and who sees the prophet, the man of God, walking by regularly. And because it's such a crossroads, I'm going to show you in a second, the crossroads that it is, she sees him constantly walking by and she generously says, hey, why don't you come eat at my house? Every time you come by, why don't you come eat at my house? Now, now something to know here, it says, what kind of woman was it in the text? It was a wealthy woman. And, and the city of Shunem was actually in a great spot. Uh, I have a little map up here for you. And um, there's kind of a circle. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it from where you are. Let's go ahead and get that map up there. And uh, 
So I want you to see where the city is in the nation of Israel, okay? I don't know if you know much about the geography of Israel. You should study that sometime. You can learn some pretty cool things, actually. And it's right at the edge, on the east end of the Jezreel Valley. Now, anybody ever heard of the Jezreel Valley before? I don't know if you've read that, or but take a look at that sometime. Some interesting things are going to happen at the end times in that valley, okay? But in that, um, look at it today. Is that not a beautiful piece of land? Do you see how somebody could become wealthy in that particular place? So her husband's involved in agriculture, we find out. He's working in the fields later. And what we find out, this is a rich and fertile valley and and it's a crossroads of a lot of different roads that were in the nation of Israel. And so we see this wealthy woman seeing the prophet of God walking by all the time. And it says, and she and her husband, verse 9, and she said to her husband, behold, now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put them, put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. So, so she sees the prophet and she's feeding him and then she sees how regular it is and she's like, you know what, let's just build an extra room. Let's build an addition onto the roof. Let's put a room up there so that the prophet can actually come and stay and sleep. And do you see the generosity of her heart? I mean, who makes a room for somebody who walks by every couple months? Well, well, this woman does. This woman does because she's incredibly generous and she's using what she has for God. And in this, we find here that, that God, the man of God asks one day, verse 11, he came and he turned to the chamber and he rested there and he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite. And when he called her, she stood before him and she said, say, say now to her, see, You have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? And he begins to ask, and he says, "Hey, would you? Would it help if I talk to the king? Could I do something for you for the king, and or or the the general of the army? Could could there be something done for you? And and could I say a good word for him for for you for to him?" And and she was like, "You know what? No, no, I don't. I don't really. There's nothing that I really need there because remember, she's a wealthy woman, and and she's at a spot where she doesn't really have a lot of need in life, and yet she's generously giving." In that, the prophet Elisha calls and, and says to her, well, if you don't need those things, how about that I give you a son? Look at what he says, verse 16. And he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. You see, the prophet knew exactly what she wanted, and, she wanted to, and he wanted to make sure that God's rewards flowed to her. And that's what was happening right here. God is rewarding her. I don't need anything in life, but I don't have a child. haven't been able to conceive for whatever reason. We're not told why. And the prophet of God says, you know what? This time next year, you're going to have a son. And sure enough, that's what happens. They have that son. But look what happens later. In verse 18, it says, When the child had grown, he went out one day with his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, Oh, my head, my head. And the father said, Carry him in. We don't know what exactly happened there. Maybe it was heat stroke of some sort, but we know that the child gets back to the house and this Shunammite woman is holding him in her arms and he dies. And she takes him upstairs and she lays him in the prophet's room. She shuts the door. She comes downstairs. She doesn't even tell her husband what has happened yet. She says, everything's well. Shalom, everything's well. And she walks and begins to walk over all to where she knows where the prophet is on Mount Carmel. She comes up to Elisha and, and she tells everybody along the way, everything's good, everything's good, everything's good. But when she gets to the prophet, she falls down at his feet and she begins to weep and cry. You know why, right? You know why? Yeah. You know why. And she said down here in verse 28, then she said, did I not ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? See, she's so upset. She's so angry. God, you gave me the son. I didn't even ask for that son. And you gave this to me, but then you, the, the, that, now you've ripped him away from me and he's died. And with that, we see that Elisha then comes running to the house with her. And they get to the house. And do you remember what happens in this story? It, it's actually really well known. There's been a number of painters throughout history who have painted this. Here's a painting. We see here Elisha laying on top of the child, nose to nose, eye to eye, mouth to mouth, laying on top of him, hand to hand, right? It says, when he went up and lay on the child, in verse 34, putting his mouth to his mouth, his eyes to his eyes, his hands to his hands, and he stretched himself upon him, and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up and walked once back and forth in the house, and he went up and he stretched upon himself. The child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. 
Then God summoned Gehazi, called a Shunammite. When she came to him, she, he said, pick up your son. And she fell at his feet, bowing to the ground, and she picked up her son and went out. Now, that's almost what you would think would be the end of the story, but it actually, a couple chapters later, 2 Kings verse eight, chapter 8. Turn over there for a second. 2 Kings chapter 8. We see the story actually continues. What happens is Elisha, this is a number of years later, Elisha comes to the woman in verse 1, whose son he, he had restored life. We know exactly who that is now, right? And it said, Arise and depart with your household and sojourn where you can, for the Lord has called for a famine and it has come upon the land for seven years. And so Elisha comes and he warns her. He says, There's going to be a famine. Now, this was a wealthy woman. She would have owned a lot of land, and she was like, you know what? This was an important warning for her to have. And, and so she says, you know what? I'm going to go live in the land of the Philistines for a time. And she does that. But the problem is, in Old Testament times, if you were to leave your land for a certain amount of time, that land gets turned over to your relatives or maybe even to the king. And so while it was a fair warning that she had, it wasn't like it was all, the reward of the warning wasn't like it was all roses after that. There were still some issues. And so later on, it goes on to say, at the end of th- seven years, in verse 3, when the woman returned from the land of the Philistines, she went to appeal to the king for her house and for her land. This is awesome. Now the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. Remember Gehazi? Elisha's servant, right? Just so happens that they're talking right when the woman walks in. I wonder how that happened. And he said, tell me the great things that Elisha has done. The king wants to know. And when he was telling how King Elisha had... Re- What's the greatest thing Elisha would have done? Raising somebody from the le- dead is probably at the top of that list, right? So it says he's telling him how Elisha had restored the dead to life. Behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appealed to the king for her house and her land. I mean, is this coincidence? Not in any way. This is godly timing, for sure. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, here is the woman, and here is her son whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him, and the king appointed an official for her, saying, Restore all that was hers, together with all the produce of the fields from the day that she left the land until now. Is God a rewarding God? Is God a God that isn't going to leave you in the lurch? I mean, let's just do this. Let's just take a look at the balance sheet here for a little bit. And let me just put on the one side over here, we have a woman who gives a meal to the prophet on a regular basis when he comes to town and then says, you know what? We're going to build an addition onto our house. I don't know how much that costs, but it wasn't, it wasn't cheap, right? She builds an extra room onto her house and that's what she's given. But what has she received? What's the other side of the balance sheet? She's received a son who was raised to life when he had some sort of problem. And then she received the warning of famine. And then when she got back, she got her land back and all seven years of income. Do you see how God is a rewarding God? Do you see that how being generous and how giving to the things that are on the Lord's heart in no way makes you have less? Because God is a rewarding God. Now we turn to a second example from the Old Testament here. Turn in your Bibles to the very last book of the, of the Old Testament. This is the book of Malachi. It's easiest for me to turn to Matthew and then turn back one book, right? Because it's just easier that way. The book of Malachi. We read this as we took our offering here this morning, and I want to explain it a little bit further for you. And so we have in the book of Malachi an interesting situation. The prophet of God is there because there was great sin among the nation of Israel. And he's confronting the nation in that particular sin. He's come and he started to rebuke them. And in the first two chapters, we find that the things that he's rebuking them about are the fact that they're bringing lame animals to be sacrificed. They're bringing their leftovers to worship. They're not coming full of energy, ready to raise their hands and praise God. They're dragging themselves in late and and not giving their everything to the Lord in worship. And then we see here that they're intermarrying with other nations. Now, the problem wasn't marrying somebody from another ethnicity. The problem was marrying somebody of a different faith. That's why God condemned that in the Old Testament. And what they're saying is you're you're intermarrying with other religions. And, hey, listen, don't marry somebody from a different religion. And then it says here that they're they're divorcing their wives and they're calling what is evil good. Does that happen in our day today? Things that are evil, things that God rejects, are called good. And, and, and many times we see that in our society even today. We know what's going on in the book of Malachi. And so it comes to, the, to Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Or if you're there, it says, From the days 
of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me. That's repent. 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 If you're out of line with the Lord, the, the, the right and only action is repentance. Return to the Lord. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Uh, they're, they're so confused. They're so messed up. They're like, I, we don't even know how to repent. We don't even know how to do that. Actually, that was just the kind of the beginning salvo of uh, like excuses because they go on and say here, it says, um, will man, will, uh, the prophet continues, will man rob God? And they say, yet you are robbing, uh, yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? They're saying, how did, the accusation is that, we're, that they were robbing God of something, and they're saying, how are we doing that? We don't understand. How do you rob God? By the way, anybody know how to do that? Anybody know how to break down the gates of heaven? Sneak in, God doesn't know you're there, and take something from Him, right? They're probably literally trying to play some sort of mind trick with them in that, and, and that's not at all what the Lord is saying. It's very obvious the way that they're robbing the Lord. We've already seen that, and they're thievery with the way that they're worshiping God and divorcing their wives and marrying others, but God continues and he says, in your tithes and contributions, in your tithes and contributions, you're not giving the way I've told you to give. And in doing that, you need to repent. What he's saying here is that there's a financial symptom that's pointing to the real problem of your heart that needs to be taken care of here. And in that, you're robbing God and that needs to change. Their tithing had stopped at this point. Now, we need to understand the tithes and offerings of the Old Testament to really uh, understand how that even worked in their day and then how that even relates to us today. And so let me do a little bit of teaching here in this. We find here that there are a number of giving forms in the Old Testament. And, and there was, first of all, a regular tithe that was giving. Now, a tithe was a tenth. And so one-tenth of what they received in income was to be given to the Lord. Each year... Leviticus chapter 27 says there was an obligation that they would provide regular income and they would bring it to the temple and they would, they would take all the grain and all the crops that they have and one-tenth of that, the, the best of that, they would give to... The temple actually had storehouses, grain storehouses, where it was, you would fill that up and you would give that and that would be used for the, for the Levites and the priests serving in the temple in Jerusalem. But then there was a second tithe that was given. There was a second thing that was done. In Deuteronomy, we see that there was a a second 10% that was given. And in that, that was to provide for three special feasts that happened in Jerusalem every year. Remember, the Israelites every year would come to Jerusalem a number of times to, to celebrate, to rest, to worship God. And in that, there was funds that were needed for that. And so there was a second 10% that was given. We're up to 20% now. And then finally... We see here that there was another tithe that was given every third year, or like 3% a year if you were going to divide it up, right? And that was used to support local Levites and the needy. And so there was really about a 23% of their income that was being given to a tithe of some sort, and that was what was obligated. But on top of that, then there was, that was the tithe, and then there's tithes, and then there's offerings. Well, the offerings were something different. These are personal offerings. These were any other gifts that they would give above and beyond that that for the purpose of uh, advancing the nation of Israel, the kingdom of God, and, and whatever was needed within the country at that particular time. And that was voluntary. That was something you could choose to do. When we studied the widow with two coins that were being put in, that was, that was a personal offering that was being given at that point. And we see her doing that willingly and voluntarily. And in this, we see that that's the Old Testament system of tithes and offerings in that way. Now, we live, in a, we live under grace, right? We, we don't live under the Old Testament system anymore. We're not out sacrificing. I'm not, I'm not here as your Levitical priest. I'm not sacrificing any animals here today. Like, we don't live under that system anymore. We live under something different. And, and, and we've got to understand the old system to get to the new system and, and to understand how we're supposed to do this even here today. But what we, what we do see here is that the nation of Israel is robbing God. But they're not really robbing God. They're robbing themselves. That's really what verse 10 is about. Look at verse 10. It says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. 
You have to understand that by, by the Israelites withholding their tithes and offerings, what was happening was they were really withholding blessing from God. They were robbing God, yes, and that's the greatest offense that was there, but they were robbing themselves. God's saying, listen, if you would bring the full tithe in, if you would give the way I've told you to, there would be, you would come to a spot of overflowing, you wouldn't have any need. And yet, there they were, robbing God, deciding that they wanted less for themselves because they weren't going to believe in what God had to say about giving. Now, more about this later. We don't tithe under the Old Testament system anymore. I would simply say, this is, okay, Red alert, red alert, the pastor's going to give an opinion, not actually something from God's Word here. Here's my opinion. It would seem odd that we would do less in the age of grace than what the law required. We'll chew on that a little bit, okay? Think about that for a second as we go into what does that mean for us later here. But let's talk about what are the promises of blessings to givers from the New Testament. If that was the Old Testament, what are the promises of giving for the... Those were some examples. That was, okay, examples, yes, we're building our case, but now what are the promises? We don't live in that day and age anymore. What are the promises for us today? Well, that's an important question. And so turn over in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 will help us understand that, first of all, God continues to reward even in the New Testament period. And what we find here is this amazing economy that God has. Uh, really, we're going to look at, start, start looking at verse 30, 38. But before that, up in 35, it says, Love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. God's a rewarding God if you do things His way. If you love your enemies and you lend to them without expecting anything in return, don't worry, God will reward you for that. That's a big leap of trust and faith we have to take there, right? But all of these things that he says here are, it's quite amazing. It says, continues in 37, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. God's economy is just, do you get it? Do you get it? By faith we believe these things and act in them. Then it says in verse 38, here's our verse for today. It says, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Fascinating, fascinating verse. If, if we give and, and, and we give the way that God calls us to, we can, we'll live a life freed from the guilt of, of materialism and greed and, and actually give away in such a way that God will give and return to us in a way that we don't need. That's God's promise. That's, God's re- that's the rewarding God that we have. It's interesting. It says uh, here, an illustration, the idea that if we were to come with a, with a, with a bucket of uh, uh, to, to the merchant and the merchant, and we said, hey, let's, uh, I would like to buy some rice. I would like to fill this thing with rice. Could you do that for me? It's not like the merchant was part of the potato chip factory, okay? Everybody, you know, think about this for a second. Potato chip factory, okay? I, I bought a bag of chips the other day, and it was like this big bag of chips, and I was so excited, I was so hungry, and I opened that bag of chips, and you know how many chips were in that bag? Like three, right? I bought this huge bag of potato chips, and like, like three quarters of it's filled with air, and then I have this little bit of potato chip. That's not the Lord. That's not God. He's not part of the potato chip factory, okay? He's this kind of merchant where you would come and you would sit down, and he would begin to fill your bucket with rice, and he wouldn't cheat you in any way. He would make sure, actually, he would fill it, and then he would pack it down, and then he would fill it some more so it flowed over into your lap. And then, you know, the close of the ancient days, right? You would stand up and you would hold up your robe a little bit, and you would have all the rice spilling out of it, and you would have so much you wouldn't know what to do with it, and it's almost too heavy to carry. And that's the way that God is saying... Do you see it? He rewards. Blessings for givings according to Jesus is that there is reward for those who give. You'll have a good measure in return. It'll be packed down and overflowing. And Now listen, I don't know exactly what the reward is because the Bible doesn't tell me what that reward is. And too many times people have twisted this to say something very specific that the Bible says with no specificity. He just says reward. And we have to understand that. More about that here in a second. I'm trying to build my case here. But would you trust by faith that what Jesus said here is true? 
That's really the question. Here's the second thing. Blessings for givers in the church age. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I told we were doing a little Bible study here this morning, right? It's awesome. I love Bible study. Here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 15. What we see here is really a continuation of what begins in chapter 8 where Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he's saying there's an example of the churches in Macedonia about how they give that you need to follow and you need to begin to do in this. And then he comes to here, same thing that Jesus said. Look at verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Isn't that what Jesus just said? I mean, think about how silly this is. Like, if we were to go out and we were to buy a piece of land and we were going to make some money off that piece of land, and we were going to go out and we're going to do some crops, and and we said, you know what, we got to make sure we get some seed into the ground, but let's only put a little bit of seed in the ground. You would say to me, what? You're crazy, pastor. You're a pastor, not a farmer. We, we get as much seed in the ground as we can because what comes out of the ground at harvest time is based on how much seed we put into the ground right now. And this is the principle that Jesus is trying to help us understand. If you want small reward, you just give a little bit. And if you want something different on the return end, then you put in a lot. Seed into the ground. That's the concept that's going over here. And it continues on and it then tells us the blessing that comes in that way. We're receiving a blessing from the Lord. We're going to be blessed if we give. That's the promise of a rewarding God. And you say, okay, pastor, well, what are the blessings? Well, it wasn't specific in the last passage, but it gets very specific in this one. You know what the blessings are that God gives to those who give according to His plan? I have six of them right here from this passage. Write these down here this morning. Number one is this. We will have enough to live on. I mean, so many times that's the fear that we have when we, if I were to give, Lord, if I were to give, if I were to tithe, if I were to give more than a tithe, I don't know if I would have enough to live on. But it says here, look very carefully, and God is able to make all grace, in verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Listen, if you give, you're going to have enough. You're going to have enough to live on is what it says here. Secondly, we see here that there's going to be a multiplication of our ministry. There's going to be a multiplication of how we serve God if we would give. It says here in verse 8, okay, so there's that multiplication, but then in verse 11 it goes on to say, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. If you give, you're going to be enriched so that you can continue to multiply ministry, so that you can continue to to advance the things that are on God's heart and that are part of God's economy. goes on to say, here's the third thing, we will have enough to give even more. Look at verses 10 and 11. It says here, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched that you may be generous in every way. You will have enough to give even more if you start to give a little bit now. Now now we have to get this. You have to hear this this morning. I want you to hear very clearly that there is a false teaching that is prevalent in our world today, that is prevalent among religious circles, that you can show up in any country in the world and and show up at churches who say that if you give a little bit of money to them, that that's going to multiply in some way, and in the process of that, they're giving you some specific responses that are actually just flat out lies, and they're seeking to enrich themselves. Did you know that there are people who use God's word, who are charlatans, who are in it for themselves? who simply are trying to enrich their own lives, their own influence, their own power. And they use God's Word, and they use the precious teaching of God's words, and texts like this one, and they say that if you give, then you'll get something. If you give, you'll get. Is something that is very commonly taught in Christian churches. And that's not what the Word of God is saying. The prosperity gospel is a false teaching. Don't believe it. Don't fall for it ever. Look out for it. Because what the Bible says 
is that if you give, you'll get so that you can give more. That's the teaching of God's Word. That's what was just said here in these verses. If you give, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll, get, you'll get a reward, but the whole purpose of it is so that you would multiply the ministry of God. It's not for you. It's not for your benefit. It's for the Lord and what He wants to do in you at that time. But in that, we need to actually give. And many times people wait and they say, you know what, okay, so I'll start to give when I'm rich enough to give. I'll start to give when, when at, you know, I, I get enough money, I get to a certain level, that's when I'll start to give. I, I can't give right now because I'm in such difficult place. And I would say that there is actually a man who's gone before us, actually a man who's probably, I'm going to guess, I don't know, maybe, given more than anybody in the world, in the history of the world, to the church. Anybody know who... Norman, I'm sorry, Norman, John D. Rockefeller is, okay, Standard Oil, turn of the century. He died in 1937. He was one of the world's richest business barons at that particular time. In his lifetime, he gave away an equivalent of today $5 billion. That's what he gave away. He told his story this way. He says, I had to begin work as a small boy to support my mother. My first wages amounted to $1.50 per week. The first week after I went to work, I took the $1.50 home to my mother. She held it in her lap and explained to me that she would be happy if I would give a tenth of it to the Lord. And I did. And from that week until this day, I have tithed on every dollar God has entrusted to me. And I want to say that if I had not tithed the first dollar I made, I would not have tithed the first million dollars I made. You have to understand that it's not about amount. We've been saying this all throughout the series. It's not about amount. It's about heart. And if you would begin to do what God says today, and if you would begin to give, He will give you more so that... Listen, you're not going to get rich off this. That's not God's plan. But He wants to use you in such a way that you would be used for His kingdom purposes and that ministry would multiply. You know why? It's because it's not about you. That's the best news you've heard all day. It's not about you. It's about the Lord every single time. Here we're talking about blessings that we happen when we give. Here's notice, has any money been involved in this yet? Not really. Right? Not getting rich? Nope, not yet. We're gonna have enough to live on. We're gonna have a ministry that multiplies. We're gonna be able to give more, and that's gonna be awesome. Here's number four. People will thank God that their need was met. That's the promise of the Bible. If you give. It says in verse, 12, uh, verse 11, you'll be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. I mean, think about that. Could you do something that would produce God being thanked for something? Wouldn't that be awesome? Like if we could do something that God would be thanked for, like that's great purpose in life. That's, that's some of the best things that we could possibly do in life. If we could do something that would engender other people to thank God, that would be awesome. That's what happens when we give. Here's a fifth thing. People will praise God for our generosity. In verse 13 it says, by their, by their approval of the service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for others. Listen, if we give, people are going to not just thank God, they're going to come to a spot of praising Him and worshiping Him and glorifying Him. Like, Do you think that, that's something that God's really interested in? Of course, of course, the whole thing is about His glory. And if you could call somebody else to cause Him to be glorified, that's one of the best things we could ever do in this life. And then finally here, number six, it says people will pray for us. In verse 14, it says, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Of course, of course people are going to pray for you. They're gonna, they're, I'm so thankful, I'm so grateful, and I'm going to pray for the God's best in your life because you've given generously. And, and so, you want people praying for you? Anybody want somebody praying for you? I mean, that's like one of the most valuable things that we could get from somebody else in this world. The prayers of others for us is one of the most valuable things. And that happens when we're generous. These are the blessings that God has said that we will receive. And He says we receive this. And that, now notice this at the end. But thanks be to God for His inexpressible gift. He's not talking about money anymore. He's not talking about resources anymore. He's actually talking about Jesus Christ. That's the inexpressible gift. 
He's saying, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift, which helps us to see how we actually give to the Lord matters and, and the blessings that come are never anything that's about us, but, but we get to do that out of a motivation for God being glorified and Jesus being lifted in such a way that others know Him. If you're sitting here today, I want you to know that there have been people who have given so that you could be here. They've given over the course of 10, 12, 15 years in a way that allows us to function as a church so that we could proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What we just sang earlier. They gave in such a way so that you would hear about the inexpressible gift. And I don't know if you're here today and if you've never heard that before, but you need to understand that that the giving of the people of God to the church of God is there so that there would be a witness of God here on this earth. So let's do that right now, right? We, We all are sinners. Every single one of us here falls short of God's glory. And because of that, we have a broken relationship with God. Did you know that? If you're here today and you've never ever trusted Jesus Christ for faith and salvation, you have a broken relationship with God that you can't fix any other way. There's nothing you can do. There's no other philosophy that you can believe. There's no other religion that offers the way, the truth, and the life that we talked about earlier. But, but God, He got involved And even though there was no way for you to reach God, He reached down onto earth and He sent His Son Jesus to come as a a little baby at first, to live among us perfectly, to show the perfection that we don't have, and then to die the death that we deserved. And that's what you believe in. That's what you believe if you've never had a relationship restored to God. You believe that Jesus did enough for you. You believe that Jesus died in your place. And this morning... People have given in such a way that he, they brought you together here today that you would hear this and that you would understand the reason that we give isn't to make our church great, isn't to do, advance ourselves in any way. It's simply to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is Lord and that you would hear that today and that you would believe that. Like everybody here who's given to this cause believes that that's the thing that's most worthwhile to give to, that you could hear that And we would ask you to consider it and to believe it as the Lord leads you in that. That's the inexpressible gift that we have. Now with that, we see all of God's promises, but we need to understand that there's a plan. And I don't know if you're here today and you're like, okay, so there's all these promises and and I'm ready to actually move into a spot of giving the way that God wants me to give, then then pastor, tell me what that is. That's, that's where we're going next here, okay? That, that's, we need to understand, how has God called us to give? Uh, what, what is the way that we're supposed to do that? Is there a mount? Is there a, a time? Is there a, what, what do we do for that? And God's Word has been very clear to help us with that here this morning. And so, let's talk about God's plan for giving. That's the second main thing here this morning. The New Testament describes, I believe, three crucial parts to giving. Three things that every giver needs to understand to to be on God's program for giving in such a way that He rewards. And the first is found right here in in 2 Corinthians. It's actually in uh, chapter 8 here. You might have to turn back a page. And it's this. You need to give proportionately. Now that's a big word. You know what what a portion is? A portion is a part, right? Right? And proportionately is the idea that, that when you look at the whole, you understand what part you have to give. And this is such good news. Because there's some of us here today, like if God had given us a direct amount to give, if He said, you know what, every time you come to church, you need to give, I don't know, let's make something up. What's a number somebody wants to use? You should give what? 50 ringgit. Listen, there's not everybody here that can give 50 ringgit every time they show up to church. And that's great news because it's not a tax. God calls you to give proportionately to what He's already given you. He's given you a certain amount to steward and He wants you to give proportionately. He wants you to give a percentage of that, not like what everything else, everybody else does. Because there's some people in the room like 50 ring it, like you should be giving way more than 50 ring it every time you come to church. But that's, here's the thing, give proportionately, it's not based on an amount. That's God's, there's some good news there. And so look at me, with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. It says, Paul's encouraging the Corinthians to finish giving the way they had said they were excited to. He says, so now finish doing, what, doing it well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable 
according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. You see, you're supposed to give according to what you have. Give proportionately in that regard. That's the way he calls you to give. In that, we find here that a tithe, okay, listen, tithing, the Old Testament concept of tithing, a tenth, I believe, by grace uh, in the the age that we live in, that's like our starting point, okay? Why would we give less than what the law required in the age of grace? That's, That's my opinion in this whole thing, okay? But in this, it doesn't obligate us to a certain amount, because God's not after an amount. He's not even super concerned about an amount. He's concerned about your heart. He's concerned about you having a willing heart that would give because you love Him. Because you trust Him. Because you worship Him. And that means that a tithe doesn't limit us. Some people can give way more than a tithe. And a tithe doesn't limit others who can't even give that amount but you give in the proportion to what you have. Now in this, can I give a warning? Okay, If you're here and you're married today, this decision about giving, there's two people making this decision. And in that, okay, husbands, you need to lead your wives well in this, sacrificially, lovingly, as, as you would your, loving yourself. Okay, You need to consider her. You need to honor her. You need to understand her, First Peter says. Wives, respectfully, okay, submissively, uh, honoring him, uh, you, you have that conversation together and you say, what are we going to give? I would encourage you that whatever you're, uh, the state, if you've never given to the church before or if you have a long history of it, that today is a day that you go home and have, you have a conversation with your spouse or, or just you decide as a single person, what is it, how am I going to do this from this day forward? Like That's something that God's calling for, I believe, out of this, but with your spouse, do it together. The, the thing that I want you to see here is that God wants to reward us financially so that we can give. That's the reason why he would give us more. Now, tithing's not the rule. So we give proportionately, but notice here's a second concept. Give consistently according to a plan. In 1 Corinthians, turn over just a couple pages, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Okay, Now, verse 1, concerning the collection of the saints, I directed the church in Galatia, so you're supposed to do it. Now, verse 2. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. There's the proportionate, right? So that there will be no collecting when I come. See, Paul here is saying, listen, on the first day of the week, there's a regular pattern of giving and there's a proportionate nature to what's going on. And regularity is the key to being proportionate in your giving. Like if you get to a spot where it's like at the end of the month, you're just giving what's left over, like that's, you're just never going to be able to catch up. But if you put a plan together and you say, each week we're going to do this, that each week we're going to put this together, there's going to be great victory in this. Now, I recognize different people receive their income in different ways. And some people get paid every week, and some people get it paid every month, and some people get paid in other intervals of some sort. And I was doing some research, and one of the pastors was talking about his dad who was a farmer. And his dad got paid two times a year. There were two harvests. There was one in the early summer, and there was one in the, late, late in the fall. And at two times a year, he would get all the income that he would receive for that year as a, whole, as a total. But he said, I never saw my dad not put something in the offering plate. Every week he put something in. And I, he just managed his money in such a way where he either knew what was coming or he, by faith, believed what was coming. And he would give regularly to the church, even though there was a, it was a management issue. Right? I think we can do that. And then he said, at the end, at every harvest, there came a time where they wrote a whole bunch of other extra checks because they knew what they gave regularly to the church, and then they would give all sorts of extra things that would go to different missionaries and organizations that they supported. And and just out of the abundance of the harvest, they were able to write those checks. And what a great example, I believe. What a great illustration of having a plan that has consistency, even in the most inconsistent type of income that comes to a person. So give proportionally. That's the first concept. Secondly, give consistently according to a plan. Here's the third. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Give personally, willingly, and cheerfully. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. So each one, that's personally, right? Must decide in his heart. Okay, that's, that's your willingness. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's the kind of giver that God loves. Interesting word there for cheerful. It actually is our word in English 
hilarious. Okay, that's the word that's translated there. And not that there's hilari- hilariousness to what we give, but the idea of the, the cheerfulness of, a, of something that has turned hilarious, uh, that we would actually be joyful in that. And isn't that the opposite of what we often think? <laughs> we often think we would be more joyful if we had more. But the key to joy is not in keeping or hoarding, but it's in giving according to God's Word. Winston Churchill said it this way, We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. I think that was fantastic. I think he landed directly on the bullseye on that one. That idea that what we get is maybe what we live on, but our true life, true happiness, through joy and fulfillment in life comes through what we give. It's natural to think that we'll be more cheerful if we keep more, but in keeping and hoarding, like that never makes us happy. That never makes us happy. And so God has called us to give personally and willingly and cheerfully. And I believe those are the three concepts that God really gives us for how to give. I believe that we're to give proportionately. We're to have a consistent plan, and we're supposed to do it personally, willingly, and cheerfully. Like, I think if we did those three things, that God would be greatly honored in our giving, and that's really what God is calling for. But in that, would you understand that as you do that, the motivation, the, the thing behind that, so many times it's taught wrong. It's taught like you have to do these things, and that's not what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to help you understand that you do that because God rewards richly those who follow His plan in this way. Now, that's no promise of extra money. That's no promise that there isn't going to be difficulty in life. That's no promise that God, if you give God something, He'll just protect you in everything you ever do in life. That's not what God's Word says. But I do believe you'll be blessed richly and abundantly and your life will be full and and happy and hilarious in a way that can't be achieved any other way than if we believe the promises of God that He rewards those who give in this way couple of other issues that we just need to land on. This is a teaching element, right, here this morning. Some other issues that we need to decide about giving. First of all, where do we give? Where do we give? And I would help, help you understand that the primary place to give is to the church. That's the primary place you give. I, I still understand that in the Old Testament, the primary place was in the nation of Israel. And, and in the New Testament, God's organization that he's using to advance his kingdom is the church of Jesus Christ. And when he says to give, he's saying give to the church. That's the primary place that you do that. And can I commend you as a church for how you're doing in this today? Has anybody looked at the financial report in the bulletin today? Like, God has done an amazing thing. God is using you, and you are hearing, and you are giving. And I, I, I just, I don't want you to hear in anything that I say today some sort of rebuke about, what, about giving, because that's not the intent, nor would it be right if it was. Because God's using you. I mean, we are 50,000 ringgit above what we were supposed to give in the month of October. That Praise the Lord for that. We're catching up on some things that we were short on early in the year, and we're ahead budget in, in total for what we are. And, and, and for 2017, we still need to catch up a little bit to, to be where we need to be for that. But God's using you in those things, and that's an amazing thing. See, I'm not teaching this to you today because we need an increase in giving for our church. I'm teaching you this today because this is what God wants you to hear. He's after your heart in this, and that you would continue in that. Last time that I preached, we were talking about giving to the church. I used a phrase that I want to remind you of again. And that is just to encourage you in this. Again, there's no negativity in this in any way. But this is a phrase that I've begun to learn and want our church to understand over and over. And it's this. If we give, we will live. And if we tithe, we will thrive. That's a simple matter. I believe God has given every resource that he needs inside this church. He's brought everything that he wants to accomplish through this church. He's brought the resources to this church in the people of the church. And if we give, we're not going to have a budget that we're behind in and we're just trying to scrape things together. We're going to be able to live as a church. We're going to be able to do the things that the Lord wants us to. And if we tithe, I believe we will thrive. I believe we'll have an abundance that will be overflowing and we'll be looking for opportunities to minister to others because the people of God are faithfully being rewarded by God for the tithing that He has called and asked for in their lives. So where do we give to the church primarily? And then other ministries get an offering that happen after that. If we're using the Old Testament concept, I think that's a great way to do it and I would encourage you in that. And then finally, just some forms of giving. 
understand that giving isn't just cash. Giving, for sure, on Sunday morning, there's a bag that goes around. We already gave our offering today. For sure, you can put cash in there, but do you know that you can give in other ways? Do you know that for those of you who have means to these particular things, you can give stocks, you can do estate planning, you can give things of value to churches and would encourage you to consider and think that way. If you're here today and you're like, man, money is tight and, and it's so hard to live and I'm just having such a difficult time just even getting food on the table for my family, can I tell you there's other ways that you give? There, there's ways that this church has given immensely as you give your time, as you give shared meals together, as you just honor somebody with something that's a little bit of a value that advances the ministry of this church. As you see another person that is in need and you're just out of your poverty, you give to them anyway and God honors all of that. And there's nobody here that is beyond the ability to give the way that God has called us to. In that, I would just say this. God is a rewarding God. And He wants to free you from the enslavement of the world's way of thinking, of sinful way of thinking about finances. So that you'll be a steward that gives. Not because... This particular church needs it in some way, or this particular pastor is begging for some money, or some objective to conclude. It's simply for your heart that you would trust the Lord in what He says in all of these things, and that you would see the superiority of doing things His way. That you would take up the test that He has said, test me in this, test me in this, bring in the full tithe, test me in this, and not, would you not see if there would not be an overflowing from that? Now, let's end with this. Does that happen in real life? Or did that just happen in the Bible times? Is that something that can happen today as well? Or is that something that was just 2,000 years old? Let me help you with a story. The story comes from a book called Real Prosperity by Dr. Gene Getz. And it talks about a missionary named Lyle who was a church planter in Chile in in the late 1980s. Lyle's desire was to plant not just one church, but a multiple of multiple churches. But it began in one crucial work, his very first place, where he began to make disciples and multiply churches. The problem was that as this church began to gather, it was a small group of people in Chile who, who really couldn't support themselves. And so Lyle was supporting financially the totality of this church's ministry. Realizing that that was something that was not going to be able to be reproduced, He began to pray and ask God to show him, how can we get this church to begin to take care of itself, be self-sufficient, and learn what it is to give? God began to work through the church through one poor couple who came to know the Lord. Lord. As they were reading the Bible, they began to come across passages about tithing. And so they came to Lyle and they asked him to teach them. And so he began to teach them from the passages we just looked at today what it was to tithe. The husband, Manuel, was an out-of-work carpenter and their only income at the time was selling the eggs from the 25 chickens that they had. And so they began, he began to teach them, but almost reluctantly because they were so poor and they didn't have anything and yet he was faithful in teaching God's word. The next Sunday, Manuel showed up and handed Lyle an envelope containing his tithe. Inside it were bills that amounted to about one ringgit in Malaysian currency. Later that week, Lyle was bicycling past the house of Manuel when Manuel flagged him down and stopped him and he told them that on Tuesday they had set aside their tithe for the week, but they were out of food. And they thought that at first it would be okay if they would use the money from the tithe, but then they decided they shouldn't do that at all. And so they they went out to their chicken shed early on that Tuesday morning and they noticed that there were a lot of eggs already at 6.30. Normally, there wasn't many eggs until about noon, and so they took and collected all the extra eggs, or seemingly extra, that they had there, and they sold the rest, they, sold, they ate a few, they sold the rest, and they got bread for the day. Later that day, a man came by in a push cart and asked them if they had any manure to sell. Well, they hadn't cleaned out their chicken coop in weeks, and so they began to clean it out and sold 20 sackfuls of manure to the man, which was enough for groceries and to feed the chickens and still had some money left over. Manuel's wife needed shoes, and so that day, she, that afternoon, she went to the neighboring town to buy some. And so she ran in, while she was there, she ran into her nephew, who she hadn't seen for five years. And they began to talk. She found out that he owned a shoe store, and she, he invited her to come. And 
So he picked, she went around and carefully picked out a pair that she could afford, but the nephew insisted on giving to her as a gift. And so she went back home with new shoes and the money she had bought, brought with her. It's interesting, as the story continued, a few weeks later, Manuel found, the job, found work on a project that would last for two years. Their income increased, and they continued to tithe, and it was providing about half of the church's income. Others began to hear about the tithing experience and experiment in Manuel's house, and they began to ask and figure out, what does that mean as well? The congregation grew, and the income grew, and there was a surplus available every month, and so Lyle suggested that they support one of the national missionaries who was working with nearby Indians. They began to support him, about 20 U.S. dollars a month. But before long, they were ready to hire a pastor for themselves, and so they hired that national pastor who they'd been supporting. And in that same year, they also purchased the building that, the, that Lyle had been renting for them and the land around it and built a parsonage and, and put an auditorium on it that seated 200 people. Lyle, the missionary, and his wife were therefore able to move on and plant another church. No one got rich, but God's blessing was obvious upon the first tithing gift of less than one ringgit and the faith that it represented. God rewards giving, and He builds His church through the faithful financial worship of His people. 